let's first ask, what's the difference between a struct and a class? This one is easy. Uh, like a struct, you can't define uh, functions. It's just uh, data types. Uh, like It's just for data, pretty much. Your phone, can you put a shirt on? Yeah. So I am currently... Yep, you, have, you, have pants, you have pants on too, right? I do have pants on. Yes, I okay. do. Okay, good. Okay, good. That would be um, Okay, let's go. Yeah, so I'm currently uh, in school. I don't have my bachelor's degree yet, but I have an associate's in computer science. Um, okay. I started working in the industry before I went to school, which is kind of weird. Like, I got super lucky with the Indeed Apply. Um, okay. And I just switched to a new company six months ago now, and I'm doing, like, embedded and adjacent things. And I'm thinking about quant possibly as, like, a, a route for me because I, I do – like invest on the side and I, I do like trading and stuff like that. So I feel like that could okay. be a, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Viable. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you some questions just to get suss out your background a bit more. Sure. And if, and if you can, I don't like talking to people like this. So if you can just kind of. Yeah. Let me, let me put my phone. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Um, awesome. So I'm um, assuming you do um, C. Uh, I do C plus. Stuff? I do C plus plus. Have you heard of QT before? Yeah. Isn't that a GUI framework? Yeah, it's a GUI framework, and the back end is all C++. Um, I, C specifically, no, it's, it's basically like C++. Python is my major language for like data structures and algorithms and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, C++ is what I use on a daily basis. Okay. I think that's a good combination if you know Qt, C++, and Python. I think that's... Yeah. Um... Um, like I, on my first day, pretty much, I had to like set up the environment and like go through all the Octo build and like set up U-Boot, which is a bootloader, um, and set all that up so that I can actually like compile... Because like... I have an image that I have to put on the embedded device to make it run. So I had to like go through that entire build process. Um, that That's probably the extent of it, but I feel like that's fairly in depth of what I had to do. That's a, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good experience for first day. Yeah. To be honest. Like, I got what, super what, lucky. Yeah. What you'll have in quant is like first day, they'll say, this is our code base. Like your first task <laughs> is to like, this is the app, this is the application suite. We want you to build it. So they're effectively sure. seeing how you can deal with ambiguity. So yeah. in terms of operating systems, um, uh, I'm going to ask you the same. Were you were you watching the previous caller? I don't want to maybe ask the same questions. Uh, I only saw like the last like five minutes or so, so I don't think I saw too okay. much. Okay. Um, there's two spaces in an operating system. Do you know what they are? And they're usually segregated by like security and permissions. Two spaces in operating. No, I, I don't know the answer to that now. Okay. Have you heard of like kernel space and user space? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I know the difference between those two. Yeah. Okay. So... When you have a user space application, which I guess is essentially what you write, you're writing an application to interface mm -hmm. with the operating system, sure. and it wants to make a, a command that requires an elevated level of privilege. Mm -hmm. What is that command called? Sudo. Sudo. Um, so that will give you permission to run like a terminal command. But let's say you, your right. actual application wants mm -hmm. to run a command at an elevated privilege. Like, for example, I make an I.O. request. Like a send a something over the call? network. Like a, a syscall, yeah. Syscall, yeah, yeah. 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 So... A syscall allows you to elevate that privilege. Yeah. So it allows you to... Uh, so I guess what happens after a syscall is made? Um, I you know believe... You, you make a syscall. Doesn't it sleep the current process and switch over to the kernel that makes the I.O. call to... Or like if you're running a disk, whatever. And then after that's done, it like, it like blocks it. And then after it's done, it returns back to the process. Yeah, that's right. So that's a high level. I would say that's a, a relatively good B-level answer. Okay. Like for your level, that was a passable answer. Uh -huh. Do you know what happens though between the syscall and the returning to the sleep program? Context switch, or no? Is that something um, different? Effectively, um, there might be context switches between the sleep thread, the sleep process, and I mean, yeah, it is a context switch because you're putting it to sleep, you're saving its register, yeah, etc. But on the operating system side, not on the user space process side. Um, I'm pretty sure I read this in the book because I think it's in the first part, but I don't remember the name. But it's like it, it goes into like a. I know it goes into some state where it does something. I don't know the word though. I sure, know um, you. It's called like a trap table. Yes, a trap. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Effectively, a, a system call is associated with a unique ID, and that uh -huh. ID indexes into a key of a trap table, and then like a trap handler, which is a uh -huh. operating system call, uh -huh. effectively uh, executes that instruction, and then it returns from trap is what it's called. Uh -huh. And then uh, it returns back to the user space program. So okay. the reason I'm, I'm bringing up these questions is these are the sorts of questions you might get asked like in a, sure. um, in a quant interview. So I, I want to also yeah. stick to operating systems because this may or may not be re relevant to embedded systems, but you know, every mm -hmm. program has a program control block, which mm -hmm. talks about like open file descriptors. It might have additional mm -hmm. state regarding what the program is, like how big it is, et cetera. 
Um, but every program also has memory allocated to it. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. There's 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 three basic parts of a program in terms of like, excuse me, the different segments of a program. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one of them. It's the code segment or the text segment. Okay. Do you know what the other two segments might be? And this is definitely in that book. I I don't. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Have you heard of a stack? Yes. Okay, what, sta e stack data structure or stack like memory? Stack memory. Yes, yes. I, the, the difference between stack and heap, yeah, I know, I know those parts. Okay. So what is the difference? So heap is like, um, if you were to call like a, the new operator, mom, hold on one second. Um, sorry. If you were to call like the new operator, um, say say you have like a dynamic, you, you want to allocate like a dynamic array or something like that, you call the new operator because it's of not fixed size, and then if you call like in array brackets like five that's on the stack right because you're you're it, like pre-compile time or at compile time it's known and that's what's on the stack and then at, at run time is what the heap is yep that's that's right um what's it why would the stack be faster than the heap um because it's already predefined so you like I, why is it faster because it, it there's no extra operation i guess that needs to be done like you you I, that's probably not the right answer. But you're kind of on the right track, so I'll, I'll let you cook a little. Um, yeah, I mean, like, because if you call new, right, like it has to allocate memory, and then you have to insert items in there. But if it's on the stack, it's pre-allocated before it compiles, and then the items are already in there. So, I, I guess at that point you just be. Well, I, no, I guess they both use pointers to put the memory in there, but I, I, I guess just because it's it's before compile time or at compile time, it would be faster because of that, right? Yeah, so you're you're kind of on the right track, and even though you don't know the answer, I'd still kind of pass you on this because I, I like the way you're thinking about this, right? So it's not about whether you get the answer; it's about how you think about it, really. So yeah, effectively, like everything that's on the stack, like you said, int x equals one, mm -hmm. all the size of those variables are known at compile time. Yeah, exactly. Right. So effectively, blazing through the stack involves incrementing a pointer by the size of the type. So yeah. to go from x to y, if x is just an integer, that's well, okay, thirty-two bits or mm -hmm. four bytes, increment the pointer yep. by four bytes, get yep. the next variable. On the other hand, new is a runtime or dynamic allocation, mm -hmm. right? So you have to go and or look in the free list and see yep. you know, which chunk I want to allocate and manage that state. Let me ask mm -hmm. you this, because um, we're on kind of a similar topic. Um, mm -hmm. How big is a pointer? Isn't it the size of the type that it's referencing? Nope. No, it's not. Yeah, I don't know then. Okay, so 64-bit architecture, it's eight bytes. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. How many bits are in a byte? Eight. Okay. Have you heard of the size-off operator in C++? Yes, yeah. What does it return? It returns in bytes, I believe, or whatever. So if you do, like, size of in, I think it should... I, like, if you if it's, like, an I32, or if it's a signed 32 integer, it should be 32, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Um... Okay, I'm just trying to kind of suss out your, your fundamentals and, and see where the weak spots are and where the strong spots are. So um, they're going to ask you this. What's your favorite part of C++? What's your favorite feature added to C++ 11? So I'm being specific with you here because most people say, I like C++ because, but that's not the question. The question is, what was added in 11 that you liked? And there's a lot added in 11. So We'll see. So yeah, that's the thing. Because I, I <laughs> haven't used previous versions. I don't know the, what was added when. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I like, I, I think I believe like whatever the most recent one is, is like, if I were to do a school project, like I, I just would install that, but if it were like the compiler would, would run that, but at my job, I, I don't know the difference between the two or like what was added. Okay. One of the biggest thing is Lambda is like anonymous functions. Do you use okay. those? I have infrequently, but I do know what a Lambda is. Yeah. Okay. So how does a Lambda look like in C++? Like it would be like in X equals like, uh, brackets and then. Uh, parentheses and it, it, it's it's like an unnamed anonymous function if you set it to yeah like a, bracket a sorry but you said int a, you said int x i was confused about that part you kind of got it at the second part but you it, it may, maybe not so i haven't done in c plus plus i haven't i'm thinking i've done it in rust before and you just do let x equal whatever but i guess it's not it wouldn't be in so if this was an interview and i asked you do you know what a lambda is and you just said yeah and then i asked you what is it and you can't describe it that's like a big red flag if you so if you ask me that like what at currently my knowledge I would say it's an anonymous an anonymous function that's like used 
you just set it to a variable and it's used that way and it's not like going to be broadcasted throughout like different files or whatever. It's just like a single use type of function that's anonymous. I mean, it's not single use either. And um, yeah, uh, Lambda is not a one-time use function either. Let me ask you this. Do you know what the auto auto keyword is? Yeah, doesn't it, it, it doesn't it, it's like dynamic typing kind of like instead of like you, you do in it's you do auto and it, it dynamically types in. It infers the type. And for, yeah, that's what I meant, inference, yeah. Um, let me ask you some more like C++ language stuff. This might, might be, it sounds like it's not important, but it can really be important. Do you know what the most vexing parse is in C++? Say it one more time. I see the most vexing parse problem. Or C++ no, I've never heard most that. Okay, heard that's going to be big. Um, yeah. I literally, part of the junior uh, multiple choice question, I think previously, like four years ago at my firm, we literally had a question on that. Okay. So effectively, the most vexing parse says that anything that looks like a function declaration mm -hmm. will be interpreted as one. Okay. So if you write like int f and then brackets, that's mm -hmm. not declaring a variable of f mm -hmm. as of type int. That's declaring a function called f that takes in no parameters and returns an integer. Sure. Yeah, that makes okay? sense. Okay, and that could confuse a lot of people. Yeah. What happens if that's right? What happens if you try to move an, a const object? I actually don't know. Does it so, error? No error. No error. It'll fail silently, but what happens? Seg Something fall. I mean, if, if it's a seg, well, if you're saying it fail silently, wouldn't it be seg fall or no? Or no, it fail no, silently. That's, that's, so, that's fail explicitly. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Let's fail yeah, very loudly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, I don't know then. So I, I, people ask, like, are these questions you really get in interviews? I literally got this in an interview at Millennium. I'm sure, in yeah. No, no, no. I'm glad you're asking me because I feel the questions that I was asked because. Like I have more backend and embedded experience, so like doing this is is much better for me. Like I, I this is the best yeah. question. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. So effectively, um, it's it just makes a copy. It's okay. a silent copy. Let me ask okay. you this: um, What implications? This one's a little harder. Actually, let's go. Let's start easier. Let's start. We're going to be talking about member variables in a class. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. What order are they initialized? What order are member variables initialized? So let's, yeah. Let's say you have a class called class. Who? Uh -huh. you have int A, int B, int C. Mm -hmm. List it from top to bottom. What order are they initialized when you call the constructor? Oh, sorry. Let me let me let me caveat this. So you have int A, int B, int C, and in the constructor, you know, in the constructor, you have like an, a member initializer list. Sure. Like you can say like A equal like A and then in brackets zero, B brackets one, yeah, C yeah, brackets yeah. two. So mm -hmm. let's say let's say the member initializer list does C B A, mm -hmm. but the class declares them as A B C. Wouldn't it be A B C? Yeah. Okay. Good. What? Even though they're listed as CBA, sometimes yeah. Because I, I think in the in the constructor, the constructor is just setting those variables, but the the order it's created in is is in the class definition itself. It's not the constructor is just setting them, right? So I don't I don't think that would have any change on the, the order. Right. Yeah. You you may you may get some uh, compiler warnings mm -hmm. if you're trying to refer to variables that have not yet been initialized in the initialization mm -hmm. of other variables. What order are variables uh, destroyed in when a class goes out of scope? What order are the member members uninitialized? They're destroyed in. And you're saying this is this for a default destructor, not if you declare a destructor in a certain order. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I'm, I don't want to just guess and say it's reverse. Is it largest to smallest in terms of size, or is that not correct? No, reverse would have been a good guess. Oh, it, okay. okay. <laughs> Okay. It's kind of like when when uh when you create something on the stack. Yeah. That okay. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to talk about classes as well because I literally had somebody uh in my ch in my chat ask this question. They're mm -hmm. like, I can't believe I got this question, and I'm like, dude, if you listen to my lives or my 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 uh, videos literally two weeks ago, you would have you would have known the answer because people ask. Do people really ask these questions? They do. So um, let's say you have a str a struct. Mm -hmm. Let's first ask, what's the difference between a struct and a class? This one is easy. Uh, like a struct, you can't define uh, functions. It's just uh, data types. Like, so it's just for data, pretty much. That's a, You can still define functions in a struct. Oh, really? See, I, okay, I actually didn't know that. I thought it was a pure, yeah. I thought it was pure data types. Right, no. I mean, semantically, people use it for pure data, but you can still define uh, functions. Okay. Um, there's, though, another more glaringly obvious difference between the two. Okay. Um, this one should actually come easy. Well, now, yeah, that, that doesn't make me feel good because it's not coming. Sorry. I, 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 no, 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 you're fine. Um, 